natural language generations. So uh, under the NLP, we also seen uh, several number of applications like the text summarization tool. Okay, we have a uh, uh, search engines, uh, file phrase tools, and a chatbot. A lot of applications, and we have seen also some of the uh, important libraries. For example, the text blob. Uh, NLTK used to deal with the natural language and also we have seen some of the challenges that you may face uh, dealing uh, this NLP especially the knowledge right it depends heavily on the domain of this course this is in, in the slide yeah. and also we have seen the ambiguities right the, the unknown something that's unknown for example semantic ambiguity and syntactic ambiguity um, and also we have uh, several uh, limitations of the challenges like for example uh, especially in Malaysia we have uh, too many languages uh, and also we like to put a lot of so-called uh, you know, different language in one text so it makes the uh, machines it hard to understand and also we have a lot of typo errors emoji uh, some uh, abbreviations okay so again that will um, make the machine uh, to hard to understand, hard, hard to interpret what user trying to uh, convey, and also we have seen some uh, typical uh, symbolic analysis in the NLP. Okay, for example, uh, we have uh, a morphology analysis. Okay, morphology analysis, where we break the uh, words into the morphemes. Okay, which is the smallest unit of word that carrying the meanings and then we have seen some analysis deal with sound for example the phonology okay and then we have a prosody we have uh, this semantic analysis we have a syntactic analysis and we have a so-called grammatic analysis and a word knowledge analysis okay a call ontology so all this is in the slide, yeah? in the slides. So just a summary for the uh, last chapters. So that we have done the chapters five and six, which deal with the natural language. So chapter five, we have knowledge representations. So before we build any applications, we need to provide the knowledge to the machine first. Then only we proceed to the NLP. All right, so let's move on to this new topic called machine learning. So I have modified a little bit on uh, the slides. So you may see the slide that I'm showing my project here is slightly different than the one in the Google Drive. So it's not, not much different in terms of the context. Uh, just I add more uh, example and uh, polish uh, some of the content. Okay. Uh, so uh, today we are going to see what are uh, the type of the machine learning. What are the important elements in supervised machine learning? What is the proper process flow of supervised machine learning? What is overfitting? A type of supervised machine learning, especially in the uh, regression and also the classification. And lastly, how do we assess the performance of the classification? Okay, so how machine learning is actually uh, you have to understand first. Uh, uh, machine learning is what machine learning is a is a branch to to aim the purpose is to 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 train or to uh, to make the machine to learn based on the data find the uh, underlying patterns. So how the machine learn is actually, uh, you have to understand how human learn first. How human learn reflects how machine learn. We use the exactly process on how human learn into this machine. Okay, so machine learn through what? Observations, okay, through the trial and errors, through the past experience and mistake. So through the errors, the observations, the experience, mistake, then we review ourselves and we can make our better decision for example in the first case you have a kid that fall down right so next time he knows that he's not going to run right she knows that he runs then he fall down so the, the next time he learn from the mistakes he's not going to run anymore in the second case let's say now you 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 as a kid lah, you see your your brothers uh, kick the balls inside the house and then break the windows then he gets scolded by the, the fathers the parents then you know that you're not going to repeat the same mistake in uh, and so what your, your, your brother did lah, okay to avoid the same so-called uh, the mistake okay so this is the definitions of machine learnings 
so Kelvin is uh, one of the famous uh, computer scientists. Uh, he says that what is machine learning? Machine learning is a set of methods that automatically detect the patterns in a set of data. So from the set of data, he try to uh, uncover the patterns. Right? You have a lot of data here. You try to find what is the relationship, the patterns between uh, the data itself. And then from the pattern itself, you can make the decision, a new decision. Let's say we have some unseen data. Okay, some terminologies that you have to understand first uh, before we move on. Uh, probably you have heard, heard about what uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning, neural networks, uh, AI. So what are the differences between all these things? So artificial is like uh, so-called uh, big blanch, okay? So artificial refer to any applications that mimic human behavior. This one we have learned in the chapter uh, one, I believe. Right, what is AI? So AI is any applications that having human behavior mimic human behavior. So under the AIs, we have a subset called machine learning. So machine learning is ability to learn. What right? the machine is able to learn from the past historical data, discover the patterns, and find the so that it can make the decision, right? able to learn and make decision without being explicitly programmed. So what does it mean? It means that uh, we don't long, we uh, not longer need a so-called rule base, right? In the past AI, so we use a lot of uh, if L rules. So if you see this one, then we do this one, okay? If we see this one, then we do this one and so on and so forth. So this is the, the AI, right? It's able to perform like a human. But what is the machine learning? We no need if L rules anymore, but instead we pump a lot of data into the machine learning models. So the machine learning model will try to find the pattern between a lot of data here. So we have a lot of data. Okay, find the pattern between this kind of data so that whenever we have something new data, it is able to predict or so called the make decision. Okay, so this is machine learning, no more if L rules. Uh, I believe that you have gone through the practical in the machine learnings. Uh, you try to go through again the machine learning course, there's no more if L rules in the code. Okay, where I show you. So this is the code, right, in the machine learnings. So we'll, we'll go through like for in this for the first case. For example, in this case, so we have a data set here. We straight away pump this data set into the machine learning uh, models, which is so called linear regression. You see that uh, we don't have any errors to train the models. If you see this value, then give me the output. If you see this input, you give me that output no more. So we just throw all the data into this machine learning models, let the machine learning, learning models to find the patterns between the X or between the Y, and come up with the models so that it can predict something new. Okay, and then under this machine learning here, we have a neural networks. So neural network is actually a backbone to uh, to build a complete deep learning models. So it is kind of the machine learnings, but it's to mimic human brains through a set of algorithms. So we won't go further uh, about this neural networks. I will just cover a little bit in the neural network in the chapter seven, chapter nine. Okay. Then under the neural network, we have a deep learning. So what is deep learning? It's actually referred to how many neurons, okay? If you have a more than two, uh, two uh, hidden layer of uh, neurons, that is so called deep learning. Okay, so what is the machine learning and the deep learning? The difference between the machine learning and deep learning is that machine learning, we still need to pump the features. We need to extract the features and to teach the machine, okay, you have these features, and then this is the output. But in the deep learning, we, uh, no need to uh, tell the machines which one is our features. We just throw everything inside. The deep learning will find which one is the suitable features to train, to learn. Okay? So it's getting smarter and smarter. So this is uh, our focus uh, today, machine learning. Um, there are several types of machine learning. Okay, there are several types of machine learning, so-called supervised, unsupervised. Uh, semi and reinforcement. Uh, however, in our syllabus, uh, we will just cover two types of machine learning. The first one is called supervised, and second one is unsupervised. 
meanwhile for safety supervise and reinforcement learnings this one we need your own effort to 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 study [lah] if you are interested then you can study (uh) what is SAMI what is reinforcement but if you can understand what is supervise and unsupervise then shouldn't be a problem for you to understand SAMI supervise it's just a bit in between of supervise and unsupervise okay so (uh) today we will cover supervise machine learnings (uh) we will look into some of the a very common supervise machine learning algorithms in the practical you just call the function you just call naive bias for example and train x and y but you don't know what is the concept behind the (uh) naive bias or what is the concept is behind the decision tree so if you don't understand what is the concept behind each of these algorithms then you may come to the problem where you will just try and errors right you have a data you try support vector machine you try what is the accuracy then if low then you try decision tree you never know what is the co~ (uh) the concept behind it each of these algorithm if you can understand then you know (uh) which parameter that you should fine tune okay whether this support (uh) this decision tree is suitable to to predict your own data if not suitable then you should change the algorithm if you don't understand you just try and error you don't know what's hap~ what's going on behind the algorithm so it's good (uh) for you to understand okay how this algorithm works (uh) for each of these so I'm not going to cover all the algorithms but I will just choose the four (uh) which is very commonly used in in the ac~ academics wise or in term of the so called the the company [ah] they like to use decision tree so I'll explain in more details so next week then only we'll go into the unsupervised learning so (uh) what is the differences between the supervised and unsupervised (uh) supervised learning is mainly used to predict okay supervised machine learning mainly we used to classify or (uh) predict something new okay we have some unseen data here unseen x okay so we go into this (uh) supervised machine learning so this supervised machine learning need to predict whether it's belong to class A or belong to class B okay so this class A and class B are actually predefined for example A is a female B is a male or A is true B is false (uh) A is a (uh) so called is a car B is a motor car so you need to predict something new and classify this into a predefined classes so what is unsupervised machine learning unsupervised machine learning is where we used to cluster the data it's called clustering okay so what is clustering means that we have a lot of data okay we have a lot of data here so this unsupervised machine learning will just help us to find which data are quite similar to each other so these are very close to each other so we put them as one group so this is very close we put them as one group this very co~ similar we put them as one group there's no predefined classes just like in supervised machine learning in supervised machine learning yes we have a very clear defined classes whether it's a female or male whether it's true or false but in unsupervised machine learning no but we don't know what is this we don't know what is this and we don't know what is this the unsupervised machine learning we just try to use the algorithm to find which data are very similar to each other and then group them together let's say now I have a new data come in something like x so this unsupervised machine learning will find again the similarity between this to this group this and this group this and this group oh this is actually quite close to this one so we can say that this x should belong to a group for example a so this a b c is not a it's not class but it's a name for the class there's no meaning for a b c for this one yes there's a meaning for this of the class for example female and male so this is the differences between supervised and unsupervised uh, next week lah, I will cover more details about what is unsupervised but uh, today you just need to understand uh, what is supervised machine learning it's mainly for classifications or prediction okay classification or prediction is that clear okay so let's move on to the part one supervised machine learning so as I mentioned uh, before we understand or we move on to the algorithm for each of the unsupervised machine learning uh, we have to know first how human actually learn something okay can you look at this picture we have a two group of people here okay the first group of people we have a uh, six students let's say okay look very handsome very pretty here we have a six students okay so based on these six students we try to understand their um their, their CGPA 
you find that she's GPA oh and then you find out that this is 7 3.9 3.8 3.9 maybe 4.0 okay so we put them inside a group called excellent grade they are having an excellent grade for near to 4.0 so this is one class of people okay look at Brandon this one huh? hair already come out or? Hey, already come up, so no more. This one is before Brandon. Okay. <laughs> hey, so, come out at the bottom. <laughs> okay. So we have a second group of people here. Yeah, we have a second group. This is the second group of people. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have a six student also. So we try to identify their CGPA. Maybe their CGPA is average. A 3.1, 3.2, a 3.3, and 3.2. We put them inside one group and give them a name called average grade okay can so identify uh, so understand so we have a six students so this six students we put it inside the excellent grade and then the second group of people we identify the CGPA we put them inside the second group so our objective is we like to uh, predict if let's say now you have an intake a new intake a new student look like this a new face. Can you predict? Okay, can you predict based on what you have learned? Why why Look like look like who? Look like oh, you. Uh. <laughs> oh your idol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your father. <laughs> okay, let's say now you have a new student. Can you predict after four years whether this new student will score die? Will score excellent grade? Of your score average grade? 5.0. Huh? 5.0, no, maximum 4.0. Based on your understandings or based on your interpretations, you have two groups of people. First is excellent, second is average. So you have a new phase here. We wanted to predict after four years, these students will belong to excellent grade, which is score near to 0.4.0, or these students will score. Uh, like near to 3.2 or 3.3. Hmm? A disclaimer, uh, there's, uh, I just put an example. Uh, don't get offense if let's say you look like someone else inside the picture here. Uh, no offense, uh, just examples. Can you predict? Yes. The head. The head. You belong to group A or group B? B. So it means that after four years, we predict this student assume that this is a student he will belong to so called the average grade why my question is why you have this conclusion look like look like similar similar in terms of okay very good so brandon says because these students having a uh, quite similar appearance features as the group B. Yes, so this, this is exactly how human learns. So I, firstly, as a human, we need to identify what the appearance features. For example, the hair length, the hairstyle, the hair color, uh, whether it's wearing the spec, the head sign, gender, and so and so forth, right? So after that, based on the excellent grades, you try to identify what is their characteristic. For example, in the first group of people, they're having a short hair for a male, they're having a neat hair, they are not wearing a glass, they're having a moustache, their head size is rectangles, gender, male or female, right? Then we have a second group of people. So this second group of people, you try to identify what are their characteristics. So they are having a long hair, their hairstyle is a bit fashioned, uh, wearing a spec, most of them wearing a spec, okay? Their head size is rectangles and round, so gender is male. So based on this one, so before we, we, we uh, go beyond this, so all this here, so this uh, hair length, hairstyle, uh, wearing spec or not, so this, we call it as features. Okay, and then the excellent grade, average grades, we call it as labor. So these two are very important informations in supervised machine learning. Okay, to build a supervised machine learning, you need two informations. The first one is called features, and second one is called labels. I think this one I already explained over and over again during the practical class. In Superwine Machine Learning, we need two elements, we need two informations. 
The first one is called features, and second one is called labor. So we need to pump these two informations to the machine, let the machine to learn. If you have these features, then okay, what will be the labor here? So you have these features, what is the labor? If you have this picture, this is the label. So this is how machine learn, and exactly how human learn also. We based on this uh, characteristic, or then we know the answer. Okay. And then after that, you try to identify. Okay. Oh, this student, uh, this new student hit. Okay. Most of the characteristic in the second group. Okay. We hit one, two, three, four, five. Meanwhile, for the first group, you only hit two characteristic. Then we can actually predict that. These students will eventually get only average grade. Okay, so this is how human learns, and exactly we will use the same process flow and pump into the machine learning, supervised machine learning. Okay, so yeah, same. In this case, let's say we want a machine to identify the fruits. What are the fruits for this three picture here? So first, we need to pump in the features. We need, we have to tell the machine that. Okay, if the color is red, the sign is big, and then this is apple. Okay, if this is a orange color here, the sign is big, then it is orange. So if let's say this is a red, okay, the sign is small, then this is a red, and so on and so forth. We have to pump the two informations, features and label for the machine to learn. So the machine will try to map, okay. If I have an X, so this is the Y. If I have this X, so this is the Y. So if we try to find the relationship between X and Y here. Okay? Clear. Okay. So in general, so what is classification? That's why I call it as a classification. We have a different multiple classes here. So we will find what is the, let's say we have an unseen data here. So this super one machine learning will try to classify whether this unseen data should belong to uh, class A or maybe class B. It's called classification or predictions. So back in mind, computer doesn't have any experience like human does, right? We, we learn from the mistake, we learn from the trial and error here. Computer does not have that experience, so we have to give them the experience. So what is the experience? Data set. We have to pump the data set into the machine. So this data set is act like the experience for the computer. Okay? All right. So why it's called supervised machine learning is because uh, we provide the, the labels here. So this label here is actually like the answer, right? You cannot just provide the features. You will provide the features, then you basically ask the machine to learn what is the X. Okay, you have this characteristic, you have this characteristic. So what? Then after that, we have to provide the label. That's called supervised. We are here to supervise the machines whether you are learning the correct labels or not. If you have this, see this, label, uh, this characteristic, so I give you the answer. So if you see this characteristic, or oh, this is a male, or uh, you have this characteristic, this is a female, and so on and so forth. It's called supervised. Okay, we have to be there to supervise the machine, uh, provide provide the labor to the machine. Okay, so uh, so this is the equations that you probably will see. We have a two uh, so-called uh, parameters here, x and y. Okay, x stand for the features, y stand for the labor. Okay, for example, in this case, we have a data set here. Uh, it's about loan applications, so we have a uh, four features. So in this table, uh, we, we have to identify which one is the features and which one is the label. So let's say now we have a uh, age, uh, whether it has a job or not, on house or not, and then what is the credit rating. So these four, we will treat them as the features. Then we will put them, let's say in the first user having this data, so uh, this person's uh, not, uh, not approved the loan application. So let's say we have uh, this second data is a young, uh, not having a job, right? not having a house, a good credit rating, is a credit card also get rejected, so and so and so forth. So how to represent this uh, data in uh, so-called the equation here? So this is how we represent. Inside our data set, we have a uh, five informations. A1, 2, 3, 4 stand for the features, and then the Y is stand for the label. Okay? So can you look at this uh, picture here? So Google is using the machine learning to predict the likelihood of a patient death. So let's say you would like to predict whether, uh, what is the likelihood, what is the probability that this patient will die. So what type of features that you have to extract first? What type of suitable features? What type of uh, suitable features that you need to 
trick into the machine learning model? Patient gender. Okay, patient genders. You need the gender information. Age. Okay, age. Very good. Uh, symptoms. Sim symptom. Very good. Symptoms. Okay, what else? Age. Symptom. Maybe occupations. The occupations is whether it's a high risk or low risk job and so on and so forth. Uh. So you basically can identify what is the gender, age, the previous diagnosis, uh, present size and lab result. Very good. So why does uh, patient ID is important? Uh? Do you think patient ID is uh, one of the important features to to uh, train the models? No one? Uh? Okay, good. So uh, the, the patient ID doesn't bring any uh, information right we cannot say that oh you have a patient id 1001 or uh, then the tendency that you die is very high so that is not true so the patient id is not a good feature so whenever you want to build the machine learning or uh, supervised machine learning you have to identify first which features are reasonable which suitable are very important then only we use it to train your model you cannot just simply get a data set you throw everything into the machine learning machine learning will just learn everything we just try to map everything x and y together so we first uh, we as a so-called uh, the, 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 the programmer, we have to filter first. It's called pre-processing. Okay? So this is the overall process pro for supervised machine learning. So we need a data set. Okay? So from the data set here, extract the features. As I mentioned here, we need the features. It's very important. Together with the label, which is the Y. So this is the X and this is the Y. So we have an X and Y here, we pump into the machine learning algorithms. So let the machine learning to learn to achieve a certain uh, accuracy or threshold of accuracy, for example, 80%. Done, then we can use it for prediction. Okay, we can predict something something new. Okay, so where to get a data set? A lot of students ask, where, to, where can I get a data set? There are a lot of uh, resources that you can get. Uh, first one is definitely this Kager. But the problem with the Kager is uh, this Kager here. Um, the data set is not that so-called uh, relevant to our patient's data set. Sometimes you like to predict, like let's say the, the diseases, but you will look at the cases. most of the data is from European one. You cannot get about the Asian data, so that's the limitations. So otherwise you can get it from the UCI, let's uh, Brazil uh, Pottery. Okay, you can get it from the uh, Google data sets, or you can get uh, even the NLTK or the Python itself. Some of the library already provide you the data set. So otherwise, you can also buy the data set from some other resources, for example, AWS or data.org here. But I'm not encouraged you to buy any data set from a marketplace. Lah. Okay, and then the third resources will be the company. So maybe some of you are working uh, your FYP together with some uh, company, then uh, the company will definitely provide you the data set. But again, um, there are a lot of limitations to use the data set from the company. Uh, for example, Maybe a lot of uh, the so-called uh, missing data in the data in the, in the so-called comp from the company. So we have a lot of missing data. That, then you have to so-called perform a lot of pre-processing. You have to do a lot of things, okay, to so-called uh, uh, filter or make your data set is become uh, very suitable or very useful. So this is one of the challenges. And lastly, uh, web scrapping, right? So I think this is very common, especially you are doing some recommendation system or you're doing some sentiment analysis you need the comments uh, from the internet from the Facebook then you have to actually scrap the comment from the uh, Google from the Instagram or anywhere, anywhere from, from the Facebook okay so after you get a data set uh, if if you get a data set from the Kega I believe that most of the data from the Kegas are already very clean are very perfect you can actually trick straight away pump this data set into your uh, Uh, pump into this machine learning models but if you get your if you build your own data set and that's the last technique actually the, the last technique will be go you find your own data set uh, which is uh, not practical for your levels especially uh, you know to collect a data set you you need a lot of uh, uh, effort you need to put a lot of times so if you collect your own data set you probably have to perform a series of uh, pre-processing okay uh, some of the data are not really perfect, especially you get it from a company or you get it, you collect yourself. Then you have to perform uh, like data cleanings, right? filter the data first, especially in the text form. So you have to like 
last last time I I uh, show you the NL, NLP right you have to tokenize it you have to uh, lemmatize it and so forth and so on and so forth to make make sure that data is clean before you train the models and some of the mo models for example the decision tree okay the decision tree so this decision tree will not accept like numerical data you will have a value for max size uh, you have a age age you have uh, this data 30 years old 20 years old, uh, uh, 15 years old, and so on and so forth. You can also really pump this data into the decision tree. So this decision tree will throw you the error because uh, decision tree will only accept the data in so-called uh, uh, categorical data. Okay, it's not the numerical value. So we have to perform first. Okay, Con convert or to categorize or let's, let's say this is a uh, young. So let's say this is uh, maybe uh, kids. Maybe we have a uh, age 45 above, then we will put it as old. So we have to categorize the data uh, first before we, we, we put this data into the decision tree. So I'm going to show you later how decision tree works. So besides that, you, uh, you definitely have to perform some data integration. If let's say you have a data set from different multiple resources, then how do you uh, combine them together? So it involves a lot of uh, so-called uh, techniques, uh, some knowledge. In balanced data, so in the machine learning models, we have to make sure uh, this is one of the common problems that we may face in the machine learning is uh, we have a uh, data which is not balanced. It tends to one side. Let's say now we have a class uh, span. We have a, uh, another class that's called not span. So probably you found that the span email is, is like about 100. Maybe the not span email you have quite a lot. So this is actually called uh, unbalanced data. So this is one of the main main problem in uh, machine learning, uh, uh, supervised machine learning. If you put this unbalanced uh, data to train your models, the accuracy will probably be very low. So we have to perform again a series of pre-processing, for example, mode F M O T to balance the data first, or you split the data set into different multiple so-called uh, uh, subset and retrain again. So uh, to build a supervised machine learning, it sounds simple, uh, but the most difficult part will be uh, from the collecting the data and also pre-processing. These two are the main uh, two main uh, challenges I feel. Okay, unless you are getting from the Kegels, those uh, data set is already perfect. Otherwise, uh, you you definitely have to uh, uh, do a lot, put a lot of effort uh, to fine tune your data set. First. Okay, so these are the machine learning algorithm that you commonly find uh, through the internet. So in the machine learning, we have a two type of um, so-called two type of supervised machine learning. The first one is called categorical uh, or so-called discrete labels. And then the second type will be called known as a continuous value. Okay, so if you are building to build a supervised machine learning that deal with continuous value, then these are the simple machine learning models. You have to use linear regressions. Uh, it doubles gradient boosting. Uh, if you want to classify something, classify the object into different classes, for example, female or male, the average grade, the, uh, the, the excellent grades, then you have to use classifications uh, uh, algorithm. For example, logistic regression, uh, decision tree support vector machine, nine bytes or 10 years labels. Okay? You cannot perform this so called decision tree onto the continuous value, or you cannot also use this linear regression to perform the classification definitely cannot okay so you have to use the correct algorithms until the uh, correct uh, so-called application okay so some of the applications in uh, supervised machine learning is the, like classifications classify the documents identify the email spam so this is the second one i think i already show you during the practical class how do we actually identify whether this is the spam email or whether this is not a spam email uh, fraud detections, credit card. So this is very common in the companies. Uh, quite a lot of companies they are uh, they are hiring our students, the Thai EMT students, uh, uh, to identify uh, these fraud detections uh, for the insurance. Yes, uh, credit card. No, I think no. Insurance. Yes, we have some company. Disease predictions, uh, stock price prediction, and so on and so forth. Okay, is that is that clear so far for what is supply machine learning? Okay. If good, then let's move on to our first algorithms in uh, supervised machine learning. It's called uh, linear regressions. 
So I think I have already explained to you very clear what is a linear regression during the practical class. So the linear regression is mainly for continuous value. Okay, so you may see some of the algorithm called a linear regression, and you may see also the algorithm called logistic regression. Okay, linear regressions, and you will see the logistic regressions. Both are different things. Uh. So don't get confused. Linear regression is for continuous value. Logistic regressions is for classifications. So this is for continuous value. Okay? And logistic regression is for classification uh, purpose. So look at the linear regression first. Uh, linear regression is mainly to uh, build a model to predict some continuous values, which you already learned during your secondary school. So let's say now we have uh, what X and Y here. So remember, in the Super One machine learning, uh, we need two informations. The first one is called features, and then we have another information called labels. So you look at the pictures here, we have that two information. We have an X here, X as the input or the features. And then we have a Y here, X as the what? The so-called uh, the labels. Okay, so we try to plot these data on the graph here. Then what we'll do here, we will actually build uh, so called line that try to uh, join all the data together is called a best fit line. So, after we build this best fit lines, then we can actually form an uh, equation y equal to mx plus c. So, once you have this y equal to mx plus c, so this y equal to mx plus c is actually a machine learning model. So, this machine learning model is able to predict whenever you have an x here, you just pump in the x into the equations and you can get the y inside what is the predicted one so uh, just a recap probably you, you already forgot about what is linear regressions you can build the simple machine learning models also using a simple uh, linear regressions from here okay so you have a let's say you have a uh, uh, data set x and y here we can actually plot uh, x and y x is our uh, features y will be our uh, score uh, 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 label and then we can just right click here um, yeah. So can I remember? Uh, add a trend line, okay, and you can add yeah, linear regressions. So you will try to find the best line uh, that can join all these data together, and then eventually you can also uh, display the equation on the chart. So this equation is actually the machine learning model. It's exactly the same like what you have learned in your uh, practicals, linear regressions. Okay, so you have a linear regression, you pump in the x and y, and then you will get this equation, y equal to 11.1. Then you pump in the x, then you can get the predicted one. Okay? Okay, so uh, sometimes you may find out that by using a linear regression, the accuracy is quite low, right? Because uh, we cannot we cannot assume that all the data are linearly correlated. So linear regression uh, is is powerful when the data are linearly uh, are so called uh, linear correlated x and y here. But what if let's say now you have a data something like this, something like this. Then maybe linear regression is not that suitable. Then you have to use uh, high polynomial functions. Okay, you, you cannot use the linear regression, but maybe you have to use high polynomial functions, which is like x power of two, x power of three, and above. That's just like in this case. Okay, so let's say you have uh, this graph here. So you want to make it uh, perfect, nice. Then you can just right click at the trend line. So you put a polynomial functions, or you can use a log functions, or you can use any other functions. Okay, so make um, to 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 build a model which is very close to the actual data. Okay, so the the higher order that you put, the closer is your predicted model to the actual data. Okay. So uh, in uh, Superwind machine learning, uh, there are three common uh, phenomena that may, you may see after you build the models. The first one is called underfittings. The second. Uh, case that you will see is called just like 
and then the third case is called overfitting. So what is underfit, what is just right, and what is overfit? Uh, underfit is where um, you can build a model, you build a model, so let's say this one. So after you build this model, this the, 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 the error is very big. This error is very big. The error is very big. Then it's underfit. Underfit means that your model is not, not good yet. Okay, not good yet. Um, okay, before we, 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 we talk about this uh, error here, uh, come back a little bit to the to the data splitting. Uh. If you still remember in the practical, after we, we have a data set, we prepare a data set, we split the data right into a two portions, 80-20. Okay, still remember this 80-20. So after we have these two portions of data here, so this data is actually used for training purpose. So this 20% we use for testing purpose. So after we will use this 80% of the data to train the models. Let's say this is a supervised machine learning model. So we will train it, so we get the answer. Okay, we will get, we get this model. So let's say this is y equal to something. So we get the model. Then after that, we have to perform what? We have to evaluate the models. We have to check the models whether it's good to, to predict some things or to predict the unseen data. So what we'll do here is we will recycle this training data. Okay, recycle. So this one train, we put inside the supervised machine learning, we will get the models. After that, we will recycle the data from the training data set here. We put inside the supervised machine learning, let the supervised machine learning to predict something, to predict the Y. Okay. After you predict the Y, then we will compare. Compare the actual Y. So by comparing this, this predict and actual, uh, the actuals, then we will get the training accuracy. Okay, so that is first part. So after that, what we'll do here is, we have to use the remaining 20% here, okay? We pump in inside the supervised machine learning. Let the supervised machine learning again to predict a Y. Predict a Y. So again, we have a predict Y. We will compare again this actual Y from the test set. So from here, we will get another parameters called testing accuracy. Then we will have these two parameters. A good models, a good models will give you both also about seventy above seventy or eighty percent. Uh, this case is actually can reflect to to, to the student and let's say you have a book, okay, uh, you're studying a uh, so-called uh, uh, AI. Huh? Uh, I want to give you a test, so uh, you just study. Okay, you memorize exactly everything from the book. Then during the exams, I, I set the questions solely depend on the books, solely inside the books. Then I let you to answer. So you are you are able to answer it all correct. Okay, it's called training accuracy because the question is actually set based on the book. What if let's say I set another questions, and this question is not from the book. I try to twist a little bit, I modify the questions, I, I give a case study, and then again, again I give your student to answer. If the student is able to answer it correct also, then it means that your testing accuracy is very high also. Testing accuracy is, is a case where uh, we give something that is never seen by the model to, to uh, so-called to, uh, to predict. Okay? So if both of the cases you are able to answer it correctly, then you are actually in this category. So this is what we want, just right. We want a model to achieve both testing accuracy and training accuracy high, above 75%, above 80%. Okay, so what is underfit? Underfitting is where your training accuracy is very low, your testing accuracy also value low. 
okay means that I set a question from the book you also cannot answer it's so called underfeed the training accuracy is fairly low you can't even answer the question that's set from the textbook you have a last case which is called overfitting so overfitting is a case where I set the question from the book you can answer it very good very well 80% 90% but I try to twist the question a little bit then you cannot answer already okay so it's fall into overfitting by your training accuracy is very high it's very good but come to the unseen data set the testing accuracy is very low so this overfitting is one of the common uh, phenomenon in supervised machine learning but you're able to achieve a very good training accuracy but when come to the unseen data set is very poor so this is very common so how to avoid overfitting uh, there are many ways lah. so the first point the first thing you have to make sure that you use the correct models you have to make sure that your data set is balanced you have to make sure that your data set that you use is is sufficient and a lot you have to fine tune so this one to avoid overfitting underfit you have to always make sure the process each of the process are uh, properly defined like whether your data set is enough whether the, the back the features that you extract is is uh, appropriate or not like for example the patient if you put the patient id into the into the training process definitely eventually you will get uh, either one of it huh? just uh, you will get underfit or overfit because you put the wrong features to model uh, train so you have to put the correct features okay okay so uh, that is linear regressions so many we used for the uh, continuous value for example you want to identify the sales okay you want to identify the sales uh, you want to predict the stock the stock price okay then we use linear regression that's a continuous value so let's move on to the second uh, so-called classification methods so we have a four type of classification methods a can nearest neighbor a decision tree support vector machine and uh, Bayesian classification so I believe that this one we have also uh, applied we just apply during the practical class like in this case let me show you uh, the very quick one let's say 9 bias we just call this function from the circuit lens 9 bias uh, import this multinomial uh, NB and then we just uh, train top speed means train train X and Y then you get the result Let's say now we want to train using the support vector machine for the function cyclin linear SPM train the model. It's just two lines of code. Then you are able to build the models uh, in just a yeah, few minutes. Put pump in the x and y and call this function dot train. Decision tree. Call this function cyclin tree. Decision tree classifier. And we have a data set features and the y done. Only two or three lines of code, then you are able to build the super y machine learning. It's very simple but back to the practical it's not as simple that as you think so let's go through a one by one huh? are you still with me eh? okay so I, I just continue so uh, let's look at the first case here uh, which is the k nearest neighbor so k nearest neighbor is a distance based classifier Okay, it's a very simple yet effective algorithm that makes the predictions based on similarity of data. Okay, based on the similarity of data point in a feature space. Okay, in a space. So the k value here, the k nearest neighbor, the k here is predefined. It's defined by the user. We are the one who set the value of k. Okay, what is the k? K inside the k nearest neighbor is referred to the numbers of nearest neighbors means that the data point the numbers of data point that you will consider when to predict something okay so what is k k is a parameters that set by you set by the user that you want to use how many data for prediction purpose okay i'm going to show you this example so let's say now you have this data set 2 4 6 8 10 11 you have a 11 data point here so uh Two, four, six. So this data set is referred to, let's say, uh, Brandon. Uh, Brandon. Are you still with me? Hello? Okay, yeah. Let's say, uh, 
this is the history record. It's a record. It's a past experience of how many girls that reject Brandon and how many girls they are accept Brandon oh. in the past. In the past. No. Ah, uh, in the past. So the green color refer to the girls that rejected Brandon. So in the past historical data, we have two, four, six, seven, seven girls. And in total, we have a uh, four girls that accept Brandon to be his girlfriend uh, for the past 20 years. Okay, and then based on this data here, we try to measure the two parameters, which is the length of the head and also the height of the girls. Okay, for each of this girlfriend, uh, we measure the length of the head, we measure the, uh, the height of each of the girls, and then we plot it inside the two space. So we have a uh, two space here. We have a uh, two features. One is the length of tail, and then one is the height, like h, right? And then we know that from here there are seven girls reject the Brandon's and four girls uh, accept the Brandon. So, and, and, uh, uh, remember this case first. Uh, we are going to use this case later. How to predict using a Kenner's table? Okay, let's say now we have a new intake Cinderella X. So join our class. So before Brandon take actions, we can actually use this technique can in table to predict whether Cinderella will accept or will reject Brandon. Okay, so we will go through this. We will we will see how can in table works later. Okay, so this is the algorithm for can in to classify a test instant. A small d here is referred to the to the Cinderella. Okay, k is the the parameter that's set by the user. So count the number n of training instant in the neighbor, neighborhood that belong to class CJ. So this one, uh, um, so you later, huh? But the uh, advantage for the care nearest neighbor is no training is needed. What does it mean by no training? Huh? Do you still remember in the in the so called the linear regression? Huh? In the linear regression, we need to somehow uh, uh, build a model. This is the model. We need to train. Okay, we need to find what is the distance between this da this data. Then eventually we build this model. This, this is so-called training, uh, so-called training, uh, uh, training time. We need some training time to build this y equal to mx plus c. But in the uh, k nearest neighbor, no such thing, no no uh, training process is needed. We will straight away apply whatever that whatever data set that we have inside our space to do a prediction. No training time is required in k nearest neighbor. Okay, so how k nearest neighbor works is very simple. So come back to the earlier case here. Remember, we have 11 girls, 7 rejected uh, Brandon and 4 accept Brandon before. So we have a new sample, it's called Cinderella. It's a new intake, new girls inside our class. So before the Brandon take actions, we would like to predict first whether Cinderella will actually accept Brandon or whether we will reject Brandon. So in this case, before we start, to predict, the first thing we have to do is we have to define what is the k value. It is very important. What is the k value? K nearest neighbor, this is the only parameters that you have to set. What is the k? So let's say k here, we set k equal to 3. Okay, we set k equal to 3. I define uh, k equal to 3. So in our first step, we have to measure the distance between unseen data x with all the data set okay here so we have an x here so let's say now we have this data set <laughs> seven then we have a, a four we have a four data set, uh, four data, which is uh, a set, and then we have a seven reject. So first step, measure the distance between unseen data. So this is your unseen data. This is this is Cinderella. Okay. So we have to find the distance between the unseen data to the data set, which is this distance, d1, d2, d3. D4, D5, D6, and D7, and so and so forth. This D8, D9, D10, D11. So we have to find what is the distance 
for each of the data set to the new sample to the unseen data so this is the first step so step two here is we identify what is the k value which is defined by the user in this case i set k equal to three okay let's say i set k equal to three so this is step two so step three here is we try to find the probability uh, I will use the frequency instead of the probability okay so we know that k equal to 3 so what we do here is we try to find uh, which 3 data is the closest to the unseen data set okay so let's say k equal to 3 it means that we try to find the the, the neighbor the neighbor data that is closest to the unseen data set in this case let's say d1 d2 and let's say uh, d8 9 10 d10 are the three data sets closer to the x let's say these three data okay but, but first thing first you have to measure the distance so from the distance then we will know that which data is actually closest to the unseen data okay okay so after that then we can come up with the probability or the occurrence so in this case we will notice that within these three samples here two two samples that belong to reject okay within these three samples there's only one sample that is accept then eventually we can come up with a conclusion that within these three uh, uh three nearest neighbors Cinderella most probably will belong to this class, which is reject planting. So this is how we do our predictions. We calculate the distance, okay? We, uh, Brandon, we calculate the distance, okay? And then we find how many data is actually included inside this k value. Then we, we set within this uh, k values here, which which classes having the ha is having the highest frequency? Then we can predict this new sample is belong to that class. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. So how about this? Can you help me to predict if let's say uh, we have a six uh, an n, which is a six data point that you use to do the prediction. So we have a rectangle box here. So this rectangle is the something unseen data. So we use k equal to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Can you help to predict whether eventually this new samples belong to which group? Is it computer science, engineering, or art? Computer science. Computer science, that's very good. Because within this six data points, okay, the end computer science has five data points. At five, compared to engineering, there's only one, and zero is in art. Then we can say that this square here, this unseen data, will belong to computer science groups. Okay? But first thing first, you have to measure the distance. Eh? So this one, I assume that I already measured the distance, and these are the six closest points to this unseen data point. Okay? So you can see that in this k nearest tables, there is no training time is required. We are no long, we, are, we, we, run, we, we don't need to spend the time to build a model like this. No models is required. We straight away put the unseen data point and we measure the distance and we find the frequency. That's it. So K nearest neighbor is a distance based classifier. Okay. So K nearest neighbor is uh, can deal with complex and arbitrary uh, decision boundaries. So yeah, it's very slow at classification time, yes. So the third one, slow in uh, classification time because we need to measure the distance. You assume that you have a lot of data, then we have to measure the distance for each of the points. So it's time consuming in classification, but in terms of training time, no, zero. No training time, but it consumes a large amount of time during classification. Okay? So K nearest neighbor does not produce any understandable models, just like linear regression. Linear regression, we are going to produce some models here, but K nearest neighbor, no models. We straight away find the distance, group the data, find which data is having the highest frequency. Okay? So this is k nearest neighbor. Let's move on to the second one. Decision tree. 
Decision tree is among the all is the most difficult models in supervised machine learning. So what is decision tree? Decision tree is a model that eventually that build a tree for you and to make a decision. That's why it's so-called decision tree. Okay? It's a tree. It's a tree. Eventually, after you build this decision, you call this function. So it's going to build you a tree that helps you to make a decision. So this is so-called the root node. Okay? So this is so-called a lead node. So in between, there will be a lot of features, a lot of characteristics. Okay, so decision tree is a tree that will assist you to make a decision eventually. So decision tree is a flowchart like three structures. Internal node denotes a test of on attributes. So the branch represent the outcome of a test. So lead node represent the class labels of classifications uh, distributions. Okay. So let's say now you have this data set. So let's try and understand the data set first. Uh. So this data set consists of uh, five uh, attributes. Age, income, student, credit rating, and by computers. So uh, this data set is basically to uh, find out, to identify the, the behavior of a human. If let's say this, let's say we have a, this is the actual data set. Uh. Let's say now we have a uh, we have a, a person right walk in into the computer shop. So this person less than thirty years old is having the higher income, and it's not a student. It's having the fair uh, credit ratings, and eventually he just shop, uh, shop, shop, shop. Okay, walk, and then eventually he not not going to buy any PC. Then we chat up. Okay, so less than thirty years old, high income, not a student, fair credit rating, not going to buy a PC. So we have a second customer uh, work inside the, the, the so-called the shop. Less than 30 years old, high income, not a student, excellent credit rating. He's not going to buy the PC again. So we, we jot down the data set. So we have a third customer coming. So this customer between 31, uh, 31 and 40 years old, high income, is not a student, fair credit rating. Yes, eventually he buy the computer. Then we jot down. So we have a lot. We have how many records here? Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. We have a 14 record. So this is the data set, the actual data set that's really happened. Then we collect this data set. So let's see how to build the decision tree machine learning models using this data, uh, this data set. You will call the functions in the uh, so-called circuit lane. So eventually, this is the tree that will build for you. Okay, so I'm going to explain to you what is the principle behind the decision tree. But let's understand first how this decision tree works. You have this this uh, data set. If you call this functions decision tree, so this is what we get. So how to interpret this decision tree is very simple. For example, let's say now you have uh, unseen data, age less than 30 years old, a student, yes, uh, excellent in creating ratings. So we would like to predict whether this customer will buy the computer or not. So we can just go to this decision tree and check. In the first attribute, what is the age? So in our unseen sample here, less than 30 years old, then we go to this direction, less than 30 years old. Okay, so the next question is whether this customer is a student or not. Then we have to check. Yes, if he is a student. If it is a student, yes, eventually he will buy the the computer. Okay, so this is how we interpret the decision tree. It's a tree that will make a decision for you. Okay, uh, are you still okay? I like talking to myself. Okay, yeah. so uh, this, this is the tree that will make a decision for you based on some unseen sample, for example, in this case. Uh. Right, let's say now you have an age more than 40 years old, the credit rating is excellent, then we can just go to this branch, for, uh, more than 40 years old, the credit rating is excellent, then this customer will not buy the computer. So my question is, why the first layer here is age, but not students, 
but not correcting the ratings. How the decision tree knows that in the first level we should put age first, okay? But not the correcting rating. So after the second layer, why do we need to put the student correcting rating, but not the uh, so-called the income? So decision tree will build this tree based on a parameters called information gain. Okay, so this is very important. Huh? Information gain. So the decision tree functions will identify which attributes or which features is the most appropriate to put at the as the root node based on this information. Okay. If you put different, if you put different attributes at the first level, if you put student, then it will give you the totally different decisions. If you put credit rating, then it will give a different decision. Uh, to you also. So it is very important to identify which um, which are so called uh, attributes to put at the highest level, which attribute is suitable to put at the second level, third and fourth. So how to identify the, the, the so called uh, attribute at uh, different levels? It depends on this information gain. Okay? So this information gain here, it depends on two parameters. The first one, information. The second parameter is called entropy. Okay, the information gain here it depends on two parameters. The first one is called information. The second one is called entropy. So this is the equation for information gain. So we have a four attribute just now. If you still remember, so we have age, we have an income, we have a student have credit rating. So we have these four attributes. So we need to find out what is the information gain for each of these attributes. Then after that, which one is the highest information gain? Then we will put as the root node. Okay? So let's say now, let's say H. H after we calculate, we will get the highest information gain. Then we will put the H as the root node. Then after that, there are another income, student, and credit rating. So we have to identify which attribute to put at the second level. Again, we have to recalculate again the information gain. See which one is the highest. If let's say in this case, income is highest, then we put here income. And so and so forth. Okay. Maybe after income, we calculate again what which between these two, which one is the highest information gain? Let's say student, then we put student. And then lastly, maybe credit rating. So this is how we put, build the decision tree. Okay, so based on two informations, informations and the entropy. So the information here is referred to how much information it will provide to you if we put the particular attribute at this level. So we want the attributes is able to provide as much information as possible. Okay, that's why we have this information. What is entropy here? Entropy is referred to how randomness of a data set. If your data set, let's say student, okay, student give you a very random data. You can't you can't even differentiate based on this student whether it will buy a PC or not to buy a PC. It means that this data is very random. Okay, it's very random. You can't even differentiate whether students not uh, yes yes if uh, if if he is a student or not. Okay, let's say now you have a student. Let's say now you have a uh, quite number of students. We will not buy a student. will not buy a PC. And you have quite number of students. That's yes. We will buy a PC. So this is very high randomness. It's very random. You you can't even differentiate whether no whether you have a not a student you buy a PC or yes if a student you buy a PC you don't know. We want to attribute is something like. Uh, let's say income. Okay, if the income is very high, yes, then you will buy a PC. Then if low, maybe one or two. Okay, not to buy a PC. So this is very obvious. So this is what we want. Okay, so this this data set it means that it has a very uh, so called low randomness. So we have an information minus entropy. So if the highest values one, then we will put at the root node. 
okay so let's see how to build the decision tree using the information gain so remember we have a two parameters here the first one is the informations the second information is the entropy so uh, so let's say now we got nothing okay let's say now we've got nothing so this is the tree so we don't know which attribute whether age income student and cri or criteria rating we put it as a root node so how to start first you have to find the information for the data set first okay so how to find so first you have to identify inside your data sets how many uh, customer will buy the pc how many customer will not, not will not buy the pc so from here how many yes how many no we have a one two three four five six seven eight nine two four six eight nine nine yes two four five five no so we just substitute nine yes five no here we put this nine and five into this equation so this is the equation no don't need to worry just form in the value inside the equations so you have a 9 divided by a 14 log 2 of p divided by 14 minus and so on and so forth you will get some in overall information for 0 0.94 so the overall information you will get 0 0.94 here then what you will do here is you have to use these informations to minus the entropy the entropy for this each of these attributes for example the age the income the students and the credit rating so how to find the entropy here you have to set, use the second uh, uh, so-called equations shown here okay so this is the equation to calculate the entropy okay so let's start with the first attribute which is the age okay so this one we will we will calculate later huh? the student the credit ratings and also the age we will calculate later so let's start with the first one which is the age first so under the age data set here, we try to categorize. There are how many categories inside the age uh, attributes? Yeah, there, are, there are three categories. Less than 30 years old, between 31 and 40s, and also the last one is 40. So we have a three categories. Then you can draw a table, put three categories, less than 30 years old, between 30 and 40, and more than 40. So inside this table, we have to find, find out within this category less than 30 years old, how many customers will buy the PC and will not buy the PC? Then go back to here. Okay, less than 30 years old. How many will buy? One, two, three. Three not going to buy. Okay, and then one, two, two going to buy. So we will have this table. Two going to buy the PC and three is not going to buy the PC. Then we repeat for a second category, uh, 30 to 40 years old. 30 to 40 years old, yes. This one, we have only one, two, three, four, four data. Okay. Within these categories, how many will buy? One, two, three, four. Four will buy and zero. Not to buy. Okay. So we will get four, zero here. Repeat for the last category, three and two. So what we'll do here is we will pump this data. We have a P and N. We will pump this data again, use the first equations to get the information first. Okay. To get the information. So by using the information, we again we put this data into this entropy. So this is the entropy. So we have a P plus N. Is, this is P plus N, 2 plus 3. So we have a 5 here. Divided by total P plus N. Total P plus N will be the total. 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2, you will get 14. And multiply the information, which is 0 0.971. So this is for the first category. Okay, then you add up the second categories, which is this one, 4 divided by 14, multiply 0, and plus 3 divided by 14, multiplied by 0 0.971. So eventually you will get this value, which is 0 0.69. This 0 0.69 here is the entropy for the age. So we have this 0 0.94, you have to minus the entropy, you will get the information gain, which is 0 0.25. Okay? So once you get the info, uh, this, entro, uh, this information gain, you have to repeat for the income, students, and credit rating. You repeat the remaining features. So this is the information gains that you obtain. Then you compare which one is the highest. So obviously, H is the highest. Lah. So if H is highest, then we will put the H as the root node. So this is how the decision tree uh, works. So it depends on two informations, 
inflammations and the atrophy. So after that, under the age, we have a three branches, right? So we have a less than 30 years old. So we have a 30 to 40 years old. And lastly, more than 40 years old. So again, we have to identify which attribute, whether income, student, or credit rating, to put in the second level. Again, we have to repeat the same process, find the information, okay, which is the information, which is the information minus the entropy. Repeat the same process, identify among these three, which one is having the highest uh, so-called information gain, then we put the attribute inside the second level. Then repeat again. Repeat, repeat. Same goes to the second branch and the third branch. So it involves a very huge calculation in decision day, but fortunately, in the Python notebook, you just call a function. You just call a function, then it will build a tree for you. But this is the theory behind the decision tree. Okay? Okay, so uh, so after you build a decision tree, so each of these branch here, you can build a rules, for example, in this tree. So we can actually build a, a so-called so rules, for example, in this case, if age less than 30 years old, and student, no, then buy the computer. So each branch here, we can actually interpret uh, or think that this is actually one rules, and then this is second rules, we have a third rules, fourth and fifth. So we have actually total five rules here. So these rules will help us to make a decision if let's say we have something, uh, we have uh, some unseen data. Okay? So um, as user, so uh, each of these algorithms may, may, may face uh, overfittings. So especially in the decision tree where you have a lot of attributes, then it will build a lot of branch for you, okay? If you have a too many branch here, then uh, overfitting may happen sometimes. So to solve the overfitting in the decision tree, so there are two techniques that you can do here is, the first one is called uh, pre-pruning, okay? Uh, pre-pruning is a process where we define a level before we ask the decision tree to build a tree for us. For example, in this case, we set a threshold value is equal to 3. Then it will just build a decision tree up to a 3 level. <laughs> okay? Level 0, level 1, level 2, level 3. Then that's it. So this is so-called pre-pruning. Pre we predefine the, the so-called parameters. Post-pruning post -pruning is where we build the tree first. Okay? We build all the tree. Done. Okay, maybe we have a lot of branches here. Okay, branch. Okay. And we have to manually check whether if I put away this node, whether the result will be the same or not. If the same, then means that this node is redundant. Then we can remove. Then we check. Let's say now we have this node. So we check. If let's say we, 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 we get the result from this uh, situation. And we check also the accuracy after we remove this uh, this node, whether the accuracy is the same. If the same, that means that this node is actually redundant, then we can actually remove it. Repeat the same, repeat, repeat, until you get a, a good tree. Lah. But uh, this post pruning is a very complicated process. You have to do it manually. You have to check one by one. But pre pruning is another problem is uh, there's no standard way to set what is the optimal uh, threshold here. Okay? Okay, so we have another two. A lot. Okay, so uh, support vector machine, I'm not going to uh, touch uh, the algorithm or the calculation for the support vector machines. Uh, this technique is basically to find the best hyperplane to segregate the data into two or more uh, classes. Let's say you have a data set like this. Okay. If we use a support vector machine, support vector machine will try to provide the best hyperplane. Okay, the best hyperplane to segregate or to separate the two classes. We can have this line, this line, this line, but the support vector machine will find the best one for you. In this case, 
So this is the best one. Okay, so this is the best one. So we find out, okay, so this line is the best to segregate these two classes using called ma marginal, uh, I cannot remember the term, but the margin, okay, the margin. Try to maximize the margin. The, the distance between this line and also the point here. And this point here we call support vectors. Okay, so we have a lot of equations, but uh, you don't need to understand uh, the, the equations, but the ideas of the support vector machine is to find the best hyperplane. If you have a, a 1D data, okay, let's say this, so we will have this hyperplane in only 2D. If you have a 2D space here, then we will have a line here. If you have a 3D so-called data, then we will have a plan. Uh, we have a plan to segregate the, the points, the data. Okay, so uh, sometimes we could have a data uh, which is not obviously distinct like this. So not all the case, not all the case we, we will get this kind of data, very very obvious one. But sometimes we may get this kind of data. Okay, where two classes are mixed together. So how to how to uh, build a hyperplane? So normally in this case we have to transform this data from a uh, 2D into a 3D space first. Okay, and then from a 3D space there will be a very obvious uh, differences, right? Then we can build a hyperplane uh, to segregate these two different data set. Uh, something look like this lah. Uh, if you look at this animations. Okay, so let's say now you have this data set, this very scattered one. Okay, then we will have to transform all this data in 2D plan into a 3D space first. Uh, from there, then only we can generate the support vector machine will automate, it will find, it will find the best plan for you to segregate these two uh, different uh, data sets. Okay, and then we will transform back to the 2D plan. So this circle will be your support vector machine. Okay, not necessarily a straight line, sometimes it, can, it could be a, a circle. So you can actually build your own a simple support vector machine through a, a Excel file here. Let's say now you have a scatter point, right? So you can have a, you can actually uh, transform this uh, 2D plan uh, by modifying the equations. So you can actually generate or transform these two data set into a 3D space. Okay, you have a very obvious uh, uh, data here by applying some equations. So from these equations, we can convert it back to the 2D. So then it will be very obvious, okay? That will be very obvious. So we have a one group outside the circles, and there's one group of data set is within the circles. Okay, so, but uh, just for information, so there will be no uh, such STM question in your midterm or final. Uh. Okay, so let's move on to the finals. Uh, last uh, algorithms here is a uh, nine bytes classification. It's one of the very famous uh, techniques in the supervised machine learning using a probability techniques. Um, so for this nine bias, you just need to understand or to uh, remember these equations, uh, which is so called P H uh, D equal to uh, P D H multiply p h divided by p d so these three parameters you can get it from a uh, data set okay you can get it from data set um, there's a terms lah, but it's not very important this is called a posteriori uh, probability uh, this is so called um, likelihood This one is so-called uh, prior probability. This is called marginal probability, marginal relations. It's not very important the terms, but you must know how to apply this equation to to predict the the unseen data. Is it whether belong to class A or is it belong to class B? So this H here is referred to hypothesis. Okay, or uh, the class. So this D here 
is referred to the unseen samples. Okay, and then this is the conditional probability you can get from the data set. So this is the prior probability you can get from the data set. And this PD also a data that you can obtain from the data set. And this one is actually is a constant. Okay, so this PD here is actually is a constant. So let's move on to the example that how do we predict using this uh, Bayesian theorem. So this is all theory. Lah, huh? Okay, let's say now you have this uh, data set. So there are five attributes, outlook, temperature, humidity, windy, and class. So it shows that whether a person will play a tennis under several conditions. And let's say Brandon again, okay? So we want to know whether Brandon will play a tennis. So it's very so-called, uh, uh, um, it depends. It depends on the uh, environment, okay? And then decide whether he want to play a tennis. So if, let's say it is a sunny day, hot temperature, the humidity is high, uh, it's a windy day, uh, it's not a windy day, then the brander will not play tennis. Okay, if let's say it's a sunny day, it's a hot temperature, uh, high humidity, it's a windy day, then a brander also not to play tennis. So when brander will play tennis under these conditions, okay, overcast, hot, uh, high force, and so on and so forth. So these are the data set that when uh, Brandon will play the tennis. So these are the actual data set that we record. So what if let's say we have a new samples, uh, which is like this one. Okay. Let's say now we have these samples: uh, rain, hot, high, and false. So we want to predict whether Brandon will play tennis or not to play tennis. If we have this new conditions but these new conditions you will never get from your data set can you find any data set where it's a raining day uh, temperature is hot high humidity and uh, not windy you can't find it so we want to predict if let's say we have a something new data set whether Brandon will play tennis or will not play tennis okay so how to uh, predict using uh, this uh, Bison theorem Okay, follow these equations. So there are two values that we have to generate. The first one is based on this new samples, which is rain, hot, high, false. Whether Brandon, yes, will play tennis or not. We need to find out this one. And also we have to find out this one also. Based on these conditions, Brandon will not play tennis. We have to find out these two probability. Then we compare which one is the highest. Then we can make a conclusion on whether this brander will play or not to play a tennis. Okay? So how to find this value based on this? P D H multiply P H. So how to get uh, this likelihood here? Okay, then we have to uh, go back to the equation, uh, go back to the data set. Okay. So what is P D H here? It means that from the data set, okay, what is the frequency? If let's say the data is rain and it belongs to yes class. So come back to this table, how many outlook is rain and the class is actually yes. So we have to find one, two, three, three, right? Okay, so this is three over nine. 9 is stand for the total case where the Brandon will play tennis. So how many yes here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. nine. That's why you have a 3 over 9 here. Then we go to the next attribute. Hot. In your data set, how many hot temperature Brandon will play tennis? 1, 2. Only 2. Okay. So they will have 2 over 9. Repeat for the third attribute, high. How many uh, case where if the humidity is high, Brandon will play tennis? One, two, three. Uh, three also. Three over nine. And lastly, false. Okay, how many case false, but Brandon will play tennis? One, two, three, 
four, five, six, 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 or one nine. So done. So this four value here is referred to the likelihood. Okay, it's referred to the likelihood. Multiply. What is pH? pH is what is the probability that Brandon will play tennis? So out of all the cases here, how many yes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, multiply. Nine over total data set we have two, four, six, eight, ten, ten, fourteen. Fourteen. So this one is actually pH. Okay, so divided by PD. So whether you want to divide by PD is up to you because PD is a constant. If you have a two value, divide by the same value, you will get back the same ratio. So whether you want to find PD or not, it's up to you. you want to, if, if you don't want to find, it's okay, you will get the same answer. Uh, not the same answer, uh, same ratio. Okay, you want to find, so how to get the PD here? PD is, okay, uh, where to get the PD here is, uh, okay, PD is uh, based on the particular uh, features, okay, how many belong to rain? Okay, then we have to find out how many belong to rain. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you have a five over uh, 50. Okay, in the hot temperature, how many uh, inside these attributes, how many hot case here? One, two, three, four, four. Four over 40. Okay, and the third attribute, high. How many high here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And lastly, how many false? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 over 40. Then you calculate this, multiply this, divide by this value, you will get. Can you help me to calculate? Uh, you will get something like 0 0.010582 divided by 0 0.029. Repeat for the second case. Okay, repeat for the second case, you will get 0 0.018 divided by 0 0.029. Okay. Calculator. But you don't need to use calculator, also know this is a constant value. So this is higher. Then we can make a conclusion that if you have this new unseen data, Brandon will definitely, uh, probably, uh, probably Brandon will not play tennis because the, the probability is much higher compared to yes. Okay, so this question is very important. Uh, you must know how to uh, calculate uh, the probability for each of the classes based on the data set given using these equations. You just need to remember this equation. Then you can solve the questions. Okay. So let's move on to the last sections. So after we uh, so-called build the models using the support vector, machine uh, bias and theorem, uh, linear regressions, then we have to assess the models, whether it is good or not. So it depends. If you're using a regressions, then we have to use like mean square errors right? I already covered during the practical class you just call a function MSE mean square errors or you can use uh, R square these are common technique to measure the, the differences between the actual data and also the predicted data if you're using a classification then these are the common techniques that we use to measure a performance of a model computation matrix uh, cross validations uh, ROC curve or the PR curve so one of the famous one will be the confusion matrix. Uh. So it's a matrix that to describe the performance of a uh, classification model based on the actual data and also the predicted value. So this is the common uh, um, uh, matrix form that you will see here. Okay, so you if let's say you are doing the binary classification, you will get this four, uh, four, uh, four value here. So what does it mean? So let's say you want to build a model that to predict something whether it's yes or not. So if your model is able to predict yes, and in actual, it is also a yes, so you will get a value 100 here. So this 100 means that if you predict uh, 100 cases, uh, so cool, eh? in actual, 
there are hundred yes they are belong to hundred yes but your model is able to detect that this this cases are belong to yes so this is hundred okay if let's say your your models predict that this is a ten yes here but in actual this they are not they are not belong to yes case they are belong to no then you have this value here um but that's not important the most important here is uh, how we define this term true negative false positive here uh in uh in uh, so called the uh, the psychic learn you just call a function if you're not mistaken you call the computation matrix then it will build the table for you but how to build this table actually is not that difficult let's say in this case we have a uh, hundred case now uh, right actual also yes predict also yes then we will give a name called true positive okay means that what you predict is actually the actual case that is called true positive so we have a case where you uh, you're not going to predict some uh, case. that's why it's called computer matrix uh, it's a matrix that will confuse you uh. it's very difficult to uh, explain using this case so in this case let's say we would like to predict uh, we already built the models we want to predict whether uh, these uh, patients are infected with uh, cancer or not okay cancer okay yes so we want to predict whether a patient infected with the cancer or not so this is our objective okay so this is our objective here okay so we can build a table okay so this is your machine learning prediction so this is the actual data set okay so uh, in predictions there will be two output whether you are able to predict is a cancer or you are not able to predict is a cancer so we have a predict yes so we have a predict no okay so in the actual data we also have a two labels whether it's a yes cancer and also a no cancer so means that the patient is infected with the cancer or the patient does not infected with the patient uh, uh, does not infected with the cancer so we have this data okay if let's say what you predict is actually is the actual data then we will put this column so in this case it's 100 okay if what you predict from the machine learning in actual is not infected with the cancer then we put inside this column let's say this is 10 let's say your machine learning predict that this is this patient's got no uh, cancer in actual also no so we get this put this column and lastly we have a predicted no but in actual yes this patient has a cancer so we put here so how to assign this term called true positive false positive here you have to identify first what is the meaning by this true false uh, negative and positive okay there is a meaning for each of these terms so um, the positive here is actually referred to the objective this negative positive is referred to the objective if your objective just now I mentioned your objective is to detect whether this patient got the cancer or not so this will be our objective yes right our objective is to predict whether this patient is infected with the disease or the cancer or not. So this will be the label. Assume that this is just a label. Okay. So uh, another label that we have is not to get a cancer, right? So we put as a negative. This is not our objective. Our objective is to detect whether this patient is infected with the cancer or not. Then we give a label called positive. Other than that, then we assign a negative. So what is true and false here? It means that whether you are able to classify correctly if you are able to classify correctly then it's called true if you are if your machine learning model is not able to predict correctly then we assign the term called false okay so after you understand this meaning here then we come back to this table is what you predict yes you predict correctly right actual data also yes predict also yes so predict correctly so we give a true so this yes here is our 
objective, right? It's our objective here. So this is a true positive. Okay, so how about this one? We predict yes, but in actual it's a no. So wrong prediction. If wrong prediction, we give a false here. False one. Yes is our objective. So we already predefined the neighbor. Yes, it's actually it's a positive. So we have a false positive here. So what you predict actually is also not means that you predict correctly. True. So but however, no is not our objective. So we give a negative here. Okay, negative. We already predefined the class name. And lastly, we predict no, but actual is yes. So this is something wrong. So this is not our objective, so we will have this false negative. So this is how we provide the labels. So why do we need to generate this true negative false positive here? Is later on we want to put this value into these equations to identify what is the accuracy, uh, predicted, uh, prediction, and also the uh, precision and also the recall. So uh, by identifying the accuracy is not sufficient. Normally we have to find out also what is the value for the precision and also the recall. If three the values we are able to achieve like 80% above, then we can say that your model is good enough. Okay, so make sure that your value should be more than 75 or 80% for each of these parameters. It's not only for accuracy, but precision and also recall. You have to make sure that, that three of them are achieved a very high value here. Okay, so um, this one is just an example. So we have a second. Uh, technique to measure the performance is so called ROC and area under the curve. So this ROC and area under the curve is mainly used for binary classification. Okay? It's mainly used for binary classification. What is binary classification? It means that you have only two classes. Okay? You have A, you have B. Only binary classification, then we can use this technique called ROC, area under the curve. So in the Python, you can just call a function from the SK lens ROC underscore curve, then it will give you a value. Okay? It will give you a value. If this value is above, if this value will be between 0 to 1. Okay? The, R, the area under curve. If the value is like between 0 to 0 0.5, then this is very poor classifier. It's very poor performance. If you have a 0 0.5 to about 0 0.75, something like that, it's considered average. Just accepted models. If your model is able to achieve more than 0 0.75 or uh, above, then we will see that this is a very good binary classifier. Okay, so remember this technique is only used for binary classifier and the value is between 0 to 1. Okay, but it's not common uh, that we use our OC curve. Normally, we just use confusion matrix. Okay, and then the last technique is called cross validations. Uh, when to use cross validation is uh, under several uh, uh, conditions. Remember just now that I mentioned about imbalanced data? Sometimes you could have a data that uh, maybe 1,000 belong to no, maybe uh, maybe only uh, 200 belong to yes. So if you have these cases, then uh, maybe you can use a cross validation uh, to validate your result. So what does it mean by a cross validation? It's why if you have, a, let's say we have a 1,000 data set, we can actually split into several subsets. Let's say 10-fold. Uh, 10-fold means that we split uh, this 1,000 into a 10 different subset. Each subset will consist of 100 data set. Okay, 100, 100, 100. We have a 10-fold. And then what we'll do here is we will use the uh, randomly, we will choose the 9 data set. Okay as the training samples, the remaining one as the test sample. First iteration. Go to the second iteration, maybe we will choose this one sample as the test sample, remaining nine samples here as training samples. Third iteration. We choose this, this, all this as the training samples, and this as the testing sample. Repeat for 10 times. So each training uh, each training process, you will get accuracy, precision, and recall. So you iterate for 10 times, you will get 10 accuracy, precision, and recall. Then you can average it. Okay, so that is called cross-validation. We split the data set into 
so-called 10 different subsets and then we train the models okay so yes finally that's it okay so yeah so actually uh, this machine learning is uh, one course uh, 14 weeks one so I have to complex complex everything only in one week so uh, if you cannot understand you cannot digest I can understand so but uh, go back and study uh. it's, I think uh, machine learning is definitely is the future I believe that your assignment also uh, you are going to use the machine learning uh, to build even the chatbot the computer system and most of the application now are using machine learning so it's good also uh, for you to understand not just to apply like in the Python this is called functions apply but uh, if possible 